How we doing? Great, great, good, good. Uh, Eclipse week, how was that? Yeah, a few of you. Anyone else have the experience where your spouse for months was like, you know, talking about it, you know, trying to figure out which goggles to order online, texting friends like, hey, okay, we're going to come to your place and this time and yeah, great. And then, you know, and you're, the whole time you're kind of like, what? Like people are taking time. Why are the kids not in school? And then 24 hours before all of a sudden you became so amazed by it. You're watching all the documentaries, listening to the podcast and you wake up that morning. And you're like, I'm so glad I'm married to someone who thinks ahead. Anyone else have that experience or was it just me? Just me. All right. Well, Trefina, I'm sorry for all the times I made fun of you for ordering goggles and planning things. And I'm really glad that we had a great time. We actually drove out to our friend's place out in Hamilton. I uh, just got to sit on their back deck and just got to see it. And we had this incredible experience where if you were out in that area, it was about 30 minutes before the eclipse, the clouds finally cleared. And it just like, it just opened up. It was this incredible experience. And I actually heard people like, wow, thank God. Then that night, and you know, we kind of, you know, as the, as the peasants tried to get through all the gridlock, we just stayed on their deck and waited for all the traffic to, you know, all the commoners as they were trying to get home. We enjoyed some pizza. And then finally we went home, no traffic at all at that point. We had just enjoyed sitting on their deck that whole time. And uh, that night my wife's texting with a friend who had uh, gone from Toronto to Niagara. And that friend had spent seven hours in a car that day only to get there and not see most of the eclipse because of the clouds. And uh, that person's child, after all those hours and the great disappointment, was just having a huge meltdown. And in that moment, I kind of just thought to myself, oh, sucks to suck, guys. That's, that's terrible. No. But honestly, like, like for a second, I was like, oh, it's interesting, right? Here we are, like, wow, thank God opened the clouds for us. And I'm like, where was God for them? And like, these are people who pray. In fact, like these are the people, this couple specifically is a couple that came on my first Sunday here. They came and they actually prayed with us for that year leading up to me taking this job. And then they came and prayed over my office. Like these are people who love to pray. And they were praying that the clouds would open and they didn't open. And I was kind of like, how does that work, God? Like, are you not answering those prayers or would you answer our prayer and not their prayer? Like how... Does that work? Does God answer our weather prayers? Does God answer our traffic prayers? On the surface, I want to believe that God is involved in all the tiniest details, but then when you start to reflect on life and your experience of life, things stop adding up really quickly, don't they? Maybe you felt it, right? You're talking to someone and they're like, you know, oh, it was Boxing Day. It was so crowded. It was backed up. And all of a sudden, like, I was just like, Lord, I need a parking spot. And then this car just left. I don't know why they left the mall open 10 minutes ago, but they just pulled out and I got the best parking spot. And you're like, seriously? I've been praying for my marriage for years. I've been praying for my kids' health for years. I've been praying for the cancer for years. And God gets you a parking spot? Seriously? seriously, it doesn't add up. Or I think about, you know, and I just kind of, this is what I do in my head, but I was like 12 years ago, my wife and I, we, we went to an open house and we were looking at buying our first house. And I remember it so distinctly because there's all these people come to the house, but it happened to be the perfect day because it was the spring thaw. And so, you know, all of a sudden in the middle of the open house, a little stream starts pouring through the basement. The basement walls are leaking and there's a stream. People are literally walking through the open house, stepping over this stream that's going through. Like we talk about bidding wars. Let me tell you, there was no Nobody bidding on this house after that happened. It was like a miracle. And I'm like, I love projects and I'm totally in the business. Like I was looking for a cheap house. And so worked out perfectly. We ended up getting this house much cheaper than they were asking. And I thought, what a miracle. Then it was years later and I was like, what did that do for those people who were selling the house? You know, or I think of years later, next time we went to buy a house, and we were looking for something really specific because we were going to be living in community, and so we needed it to kind of fit everybody. And so this house came on the market, and this was the season of bidding wars. Like, every house was just crazy bidding war. And so, like, it gets posted, and within two hours, we're at this house. We see it. We're running through. We're, like, we're doing our own home inspection just to be like, okay, we just want to bid on this right away. And our realtor's like, they're, they're not taking offers for another week. Then they have the whole week just booked. And we're like, well, can we just, can we try anyways? And he's like, honestly, like no realtor would advise their clients to accept an offer when they have a whole week's worth of bookings. But anyways, we do it. And we go through the whole process and long story short, within 24 hours, we have the house. And it doesn't make sense to us. And so we're like, wow, like what a miracle. 
And then we move in a few months later and we talk to the neighbors and we find out the story. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. Like the marriage had gotten so bad. They hated each other so much that you guys just hit a number and they were just like, we're done. No more open houses. We don't have to talk to each other again. Don't have to see each other ever again. That's it. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I thought this was a miracle, but now I'm starting to like second guess this. Like, did God screw them over to bless us? Like, is that how this works, right? Like once you start asking the honest questions, you start to see all the different pieces and the different dominoes that are at play. You start to wonder, like, is that how prayer works? Like, what's going on here? What do we do with that? Think about our friends who, after 10 years of praying for a child and fertility treatments and all the ups and downs that go through that, they got to share with their friends that they were pregnant. It's this huge celebration amongst all their friends and family. And then after about 20 weeks, they got the news that the baby was in trouble. We prayed, everyone prayed and prayed and prayed. And yet within a day, my wife was sitting in a hospital room with them with a baby that had come early, a baby who they held in their hands for five minutes as she took her first and last breaths. Was God the one who got them pregnant? Did God answer that miracle prayer? Did God answer the first half of the prayer? Like, what do, what do you do with that? And then you turn on the TV and you see a football player, you know, pointing to the sky after a touchdown. And maybe like me, you think, seriously? Like, I'm glad God cared about the millionaire in tights running around pushing other, you know, millionaires in tights fighting over a piece of leather. But like, what about my friends? Like, what do you do with that? Have I told you I can be skeptical at times? If you've ever been skeptical or had some of these questions, today's the perfect day to be here because we're in the series called Questions We Don't Ask in Church and we're unpacking some of the questions that often maybe haven't felt safe to ask in church or questions that maybe felt like a betrayal to ask or questions that maybe left you on the outside of community when you asked them or questions that maybe you felt the expectation was that you should know the answer to or you shouldn't care about the answer. You should just have more faith. Maybe you were actually told, don't, don't ask those questions. Don't rock the boat. Or maybe you felt like you were the only one who was seeing that the emperor had no clothes on. Or maybe you're not religious at all. Maybe the reason you aren't religious is because of how unsatisfactorily these questions were answered. Maybe you did ask them. Maybe you didn't ask them. Maybe you just kind of came to the conclusion that to believe in God when you have these questions would just be ridiculous. But these are great questions. They should be talked about. So last week, in week one of the series, we unpacked this question, why is there pain and suffering in the world? And I, I highly recommend going back. Some of today will kind of build on that. If you didn't hear it, don't worry. Today will stand on its own. But I think it'll be helpful. I heard from a lot of people it was. Uh, and then today, why do prayers seem to go unanswered? Okay, as we jump in today, uh, two quick caveats. I realize this is an incredibly sensitive topic. And for many of you, this isn't a mental exercise. You're walking right now with a child that is suffering. You're dealing with cancer in your family. You just buried someone you never thought you'd bury, right? So I, I realize that. And I, I tell you all the time, our response to grief and pain and questions should not be answers. It should be community. It should be sitting with people and wrestling. But also there is a valuable and important topic that we need to wrestle with. And so today we are wrestling with it. And so if you're watching online or you're on the podcast and you're just like, not today, I can't, can't handle this today, go to the next episode. If you're here in the room, I told you last week, feel free to work on your grocery list. If you're just like, I can't, can't mentally engage with this topic right now, totally get it. Um, and it'll be here if ever you want to engage with it. But um, I realize for some of you, this isn't just a mental exercise. It's deeply emotional. Second thing is, um, this is a big topic and we are literally just scraping the surface. We're not gonna dot every I. We're not gonna cross every T. I told you last week, we're totally comfortable with mystery here. In fact, I think when we try and you know, put a neat little bow on everything, we actually do more harm than good. So um, today we're gonna actually accept mystery and the fact that there's probably 10 different threads that you could pull on in this sermon and that could be another hour long sermon, each of those. So um, with those said, today we're just gonna talk about how do we think about unanswered prayer. Again, so much more we can go, but how do we think about it? So first off, we're going to explore some of the Bible verses that can at times trip us up on this topic. 
Then we're going to unpack some of the ideas we've been taught about prayer that, in my opinion, are not helpful. Um, you know, how do you make sense of some of the seemingly contradictory things we find in the Bible? And then thirdly, how can we think more like Jesus about prayer? And I'm going to give you four things, kind of four general principles when it comes to prayer, okay? Um, so first off, when we start to explore the Bible and what it talks about prayer, um, there are some pretty big and bold statements, okay? I remember my first class in Bible college, they said, just be careful not to just grab onto a verse and make it your all, like realize that there's all of scripture to bear against it. There's life experience, there's genre, there's all different things, there's interpretation. So just be careful not to grab on. And I'll show you a few verses that if we just grab on without thinking through can be harmful. Let's just go through them. John 15, 77. If you remain in me, it's Jesus, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's a big statement. Matthew 21, 21. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and don't doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea and it will be done. If you, will, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Ready for the next one? Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And one more. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. It's easy to just read those verses completely out of context, grab hold of them, print them on a mug, whatever, and to assume if you just pray, if you just ask, if you just have enough faith, if you just have enough people agree with you in prayer, boom, that's the recipe. But then if you pause and you start to think about, hang on, there's more going on there. Is that an actual accurate summary? Because there are times, in fact, I can think of at least two times where Jesus prayed for something and Jesus didn't even get what he asked for. Luke twenty two forty two. 42, he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Jesus lets his request be known. That didn't come through. He got, he got crucified. John 17, 20, my prayer is not for them alone. Speaking about his disciples. He, I pray also for those who will believe in me. Translation, for the next, like from then until now, 2,000 years of world history, I'm praying for everybody who becomes a Jesus follower, okay? He says, I'm praying for them. And what, what is he praying? That all of them may be one. Translation, that they might be united just as you are in me and I am in you. And now 2,000 years later, the one group of people who always agree is the Christians, right? Wrong. We got what? Last count, 45,000 different denominations. All of them are right. It's like, yeah, yeah, he prayed that. Doesn't seem to have come through. What about Paul? Paul, the guy who's responsible for writing like half the New Testament. I love one author. He's like, if you've got a mug with a Bible verse on it, you can thank Paul, right? Like, this guy's a big deal. And yet, in his writings, he speaks of this ailment that he calls this thorn in his flesh. We don't know exactly what it is. Anxiety, depression, some scholars think it was an optical issue. But look at what he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. This is Paul, St. Paul. Three times I pleaded with God to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul prayed for healing and didn't receive healing. How do you square that circle? More and more you start to realize there aren't these neat little bows and you really got to wrestle with the ideas to try and come up with answers that stand up to scrutiny, that stand up to real life. You really got to dig in. So today we're going to dig in. So first off, how do we navigate these big statements that Jesus said about prayer? You know, you can move mountains. If you agree with anyone, if you have enough faith, just ask, just knock, and it'll be done for you. Like, how do we make sense of that? There's some really bold statements about prayer that, if we're honest, gut level honest, most of the time don't seem to be our experience, right? So first off, I think we might be misreading the genre. Jesus often spoke in hyperbole. You know, hyperbole is like, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. You know, I carried a ton of paperwork home. I have a million things on my to-do list. It's not literal, it's hyperbolic. It's big language to make a big point. Jesus often used hyperbole, right? Here's the example I always give of hyperbole. This is Jesus speaking. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. Is Jesus literally saying, gouge out your eyeball if you're looking at things that are causing problems? I mean, he could be, but it uh, doesn't seem like any of us have taken him literally. I suggest it's hyperbolic. 
Jesus is making a point. He's saying, if your eye is causing you problems, take drastic measures. Be willing to sacrifice to take care of it. The bottom line is it's problematic when we read hyperbolic language hyperliterally. It's problematic when we read hyperbolic language hyperliterally. I'm going to suggest that these passages talking about prayer are often hyperbolic. They're telling us, big picture, God is powerful, bring your desires, bring your requests to God. God is powerful, bring your desires, bring your requests to God. Those are good messages. But is God in the business of literally moving mountains? I'm not sure. I have yet to see a claim throughout history over the last 2,000 years of Jesus' followers who've said, yeah, and we actually moved this mountain from here to there. Right? To me, it's hyperbolic. And actually, at the end of today, I'll share a hyperbolic mountain-moving story. But I think we need to be careful when reading these statements and understanding the genre in which they're spoken. Each of those quotes from Jesus could be a certain one on their own. But for today, I just ask us to be cautious of grabbing hold of them and using them as these simple answers to really complex challenges. So that said, let's get into, uh, before we get into the four things I want you to take away from prayer, kind of three unhelpful messages maybe you've heard about unanswered prayer. These are some of the oversimplified answers or trite statements that we throw to people when they haven't got the answers to their prayers. Um, And I want to go after these a bit, not only because I think they're unhelpful and inaccurate views of God, I actually think they're victim blaming. And that's incredibly dangerous. And so I'd love for us to actually just get rid of these in our um, language. So here's the first one. And, and by the way, full disclosure, the reason I'm so familiar with these is because, full disclosure, I've, I've preached some of these. And uh, so see this like restitution or something, I don't know. But like these are ideas that I've even given because often we're just trying to put neat little bows on why prayer isn't answered. And we're trying to make sense of mystery. And I think that's when we get in trouble. So first one is, you ask with wrong motives. Maybe you've heard this. This is often put on someone asking why their prayer isn't answered. They're told, well, maybe you asked with the wrong motives. Now, to be clear, this actually comes from a Bible verse, right? It's from the book of James, and it's, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. But applying this to prayer is actually taking it out of context. It's actually a passage about people who fight with each other and who won't deal with their own greedy desires. It's not primarily a passage about prayer, but we've lifted it out of context as a simple road answer as to why someone's genuine prayers haven't been answered, and that's a problem. Secondly, it's a problem because it blames the victim. How helpful is it if you've been praying for something and you're told, well, your prayers aren't answered because your motives are wrong? We call that gaslighting, right? You're putting the blame on the victim. It leaves someone who's already suffering now second-guessing their motives. Motives for praying for their child to be healthy, praying to save their marriage. It's victim-blaming. It's completely unhelpful. The truth is, you may ask with all the right motives and still not get something. You know I know that? Because Jesus prayed for unity of the church. And I'm gonna assume that Jesus' motives were pure and we have 45,000 different denominations. Something else is going on there. It's an oversimplification to say someone's motives are wrong and that's why their prayers aren't answered. Okay, that's the first one. Second thing we hear all the time that I'm gonna suggest is unhelpful is telling people that your prayers aren't answered because there's unconfessed sin in your life. Again, um, there's passages of scripture that seem to say this. Isaiah 59, 1 Peter 3, 7. I mean, we could go into those, but basically, like, again, out of context. How do I know that? Because when we compare... Again, a fascinating sermon on, on first, first Peter 1, but l- let me just say this. When you look at Jesus, this is never the case. There are examples in Scripture, in fact, I taught one this week to our youth, where Jesus heals someone who is actively involved in sin, and it is the healing that actually causes them to turn and change their life. That person hadn't confessed anything yet. In fact, often it's the grace and kindness that they're shown that actually leads towards the life change. So this assumption that everyone that Jesus healed had somehow done a spiritual inventory 30 seconds before and made sure to confess everything before it happened, I just don't buy it. I don't see it. And I think it's oversimplifying. The truth is, you know, that kind of makes God sound like someone who gives us what we deserve. But we know in Jesus that we don't get what we deserve. We get grace lavished on us. It's exactly what we don't deserve. And that's why Jesus is so great. Third thing that is unhelpful is when we say this, you lack faith or have doubt 
in your heart. Again, we can find verses for this. Jesus actually says this in some of those big verses that we started with. But remember I tell you all the time, if you wanna know what Jesus meant by what Jesus said, look at what Jesus did. So yes, Jesus does say, hey, you lack faith. He says that all the time. And yet there are times where Jesus seems completely okay healing someone who lacks faith. There's this story of this dad who comes to Jesus and he's desperate. His son is suffering these horrible seizures and he asks for Jesus for help. Let's just peek into the conversation that they have. He's like, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus responds, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief, right? I just picture this moment. It's like, that's what I need. I believe. And then he's like, I, I should probably be honest. I don't really have that much belief. I'm really starting. I'm like, that's me most days, right? I believe help my unbelief, right? And what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, well, come back when you have 100% belief, right? I can't deal with unbelief. You got to have full faith and zero doubt. Jesus doesn't say that. He heals his son. He heals someone who's struggling with faith, who's wrestling with doubt. It's also the fact that Jesus said, if you have even a mustard seed, mustard seed of faith, you know how small a mustard seed is? It's like the size of a sand, a grain of sand. I think most of us can argue we have at least a mustard seed of faith, even if we have a pile of doubt. So again, throwing the whole, well, obviously you don't have enough faith. It's binary. It blames the victim. It's not accurate to what we see in Jesus. And I think it's unhelpful. So let's try and stay away from those quick platitudes that often get thrown out when it comes to why prayers aren't answered. And let me just kind of talk about four general principles about prayer. And all of them leave room for mystery and miracles. Okay, so I'll walk you through them and love to give credit where credit's due. This list of four comes from Adam Hamilton, who his book I recommended last week, and I just think these are bang on. So number one, God usually, usually, highlight that in your notes, usually works within natural laws that God has established. Last week, we talked about, you know, the world and earthquakes and floods and volcanoes. And if you missed that again, that's where you'll probably want to catch up a little bit. But bottom line summary is, it seems as though God, for the most part, allows the natural laws of creation to prevail. We talked about this last week, right? When it's snowing outside, we're not like, oh my gosh, what do you think God's trying to say? It's like, it's winter in Canada, right? Like, just like the natural laws are at play. Usually the response to that when I share that with people is, well, hang on a second. Isn't suspending the natural laws of the world what Jesus was always doing? I mean, Jesus calms a storm. Jesus walks on water. Absolutely. That is undeniably suspending the laws of nature. Yes. But don't forget, over and over again, Jesus also works within the laws of nature. He doesn't float from location to location. He walks. He takes a boat. He travels on a donkey. At the end of Jesus' life, Jesus is crucified. The whips tear his skin. The nails rip through his wrist. He bleeds. He suffers. He cries out in pain. He doesn't suspend the natural laws in these situations. And that's why the key word is usually. That's why I say usually. There's some mystery there that I wish I could put a neat bow on it and give you the reasons why or why not. I don't understand that one. There's some mystery there. But for the most part, God isn't in the business of suspending the laws of nature. And then, you know, because I tell you, I'm always having these conversations in my head. Like, I start to think, like, what a mess it would become if we could just be suspending laws of nature with our prayer. You know, we're praying for no rain on our wedding day, but the farmer next door has been praying for rain for her crops to feed her kids. What do you do with that information, right? Imagine a world where our prayers are suspending laws of nature. Whose prayers get answered? Whose prayers get ignored? You know, one of our staff shared a, a funny story with us this week. She's at a, an outdoor concert with tens of thousands of people and they were, they were running into the car because they could see that a storm was coming. She's like, I literally closed the door and then poof, all the rain just came down. And she's like, thank you, Jesus. And the driver turned back and was like, what about all of them? <laughs> she's like, I never thought of them. <laughs> it gets you thinking about the way we use prayer, doesn't it? I remember in high school, you know, whenever my parents asked me, like, did you study for the test? I'd always be like, this is my, my rote response. Why study when I can pray, right? <laughs> By the way, I'm not teaching that. Don't take notes. Youth, I'm, I'm not saying it was a good thing. I'm just saying that was the approach I used to have, All right? But laws of nature are prepare. You usually do well. Don't prepare. You'll probably fail the test. Don't skip studying and just pray. Why? My opinion is God's not helping you. You know why? Because giving someone answers to questions on a test has a name. 
We call it cheating. God is not helping you cheat. Bottom line is God usually works within the natural laws that God has established. Do I believe in miracles? Yes, I really do. And that probably sounds like a contradiction to everything I'm saying. But I also wanna be clear that miracles also seem to be the exception, not the rule. Lots of mystery there. I'm just okay and at peace with the mystery. Number two, God usually works through people. Remember last week we talked about how humans are given dominion and free will? I love how one author put it. He said, most of the time, the way God works in the world is not by sending angels, but by sending people. You look at the life of Jesus and he trains his disciples. He teaches people to care for the marginalized. Jesus doesn't say, hey, when you come across someone suffering, the most jesus thing you can do is leave them there and call a prayer meeting so God can intervene. No, he shows us it's actually caring for the hurting and the marginalized. That's our job. That's what he's training us to do. Later, the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote half the New Testament, writes on multiple occasions to the churches about a collection he's taking to care for the poor. He's not calling for a multi-church prayer meeting, to be clear, nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying the early Christians seemed content to, in a sense, do the things that we are content to simply pray about. They would actually do it. Listen, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for the home run miracle, please do. But when I look at the early Jesus followers in the New Testament, they didn't stop at just praying for the things that they were seeing in their world. They practiced what monks would later call ora et labora, which translates work and pray. The idea is it's so easy to make prayer lists and go through them like an online order, right? You know, asking God, help the flood victims and end the war and stop the bad people. And not realizing we're actually invited to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we have things that we can be a part of and have a responsibility to be a part of. And again, not saying don't pray for a miracle, but also work towards the end. Because by and large, throughout history, Christians have changed the world when they care for the poor and the marginalized and the victimized and the hurting and the broken and the voiceless and the nameless and the hungry. They prayed and in their prayers, they sensed what they were to do and how to live. They didn't just sit back waiting for the miracle. So bottom line, God usually works through people. Now, before we go to number three, some of you are probably thinking, aura et labora, <laughs> prayer and work, that sounds so unspiritual. Or maybe you're thinking, that's just an excuse for not trusting in God. If that sounds like a dichotomy, just remember, Everybody actually does this. Everyone does prayer and work. The most devout Christians, even the ones who are like, don't take your anxiety meds, just pray about it. They still work and pray. Watch them carefully. Watch them insist that their kids eat their vegetables. I want to kind of bump them and be like, don't eat your vegetables, just pray, right? Watch them buckle up their seatbelt. Like, don't do that, just pray, right? Watch them look both ways before crossing the road. Watch them take their insulin or carry an EpiPen and then watch them tell you, you don't need anxiety meds, you don't need meds for depression, just pray. Okay. As someone who's suffered debilitating anxiety, I prayed, I took my meds, I met the most gracious, Jesus-loving therapist who felt her life calling was to care for broken pastors. And I experienced some of the most incredible friends who understood care can be picking you up, getting you coffee, and sitting in the car with you while you cry. In all of that, I experienced Jesus through the people around me. So remember, God usually works through people, the presence of God working through others around us. So when you pray, Ask how God might be inviting you to partner with God in becoming the answer to your prayers. Number three, God doesn't violate free will. Again, remember, uh, last week we talked about free will and dominion. I talked about my job and how I empower others and kind of give them management over certain areas. And we're given dominion or management over the world. And we're also given free will. Free will to choose if we will choose the way of love or the opposite, the, uh, you know, the way of Jesus or the opposite. But God doesn't brainwash people or force people to choose the right way. I think of the rich young ruler. It's the story of this young man who's really wealthy and he comes to Jesus and he's like, hey, what must I do to follow you? And Jesus tells him and he walks away. And the next verse is, so then Jesus changed his mind and brought him back. It's not there. Because Jesus can prompt and invite, but he's not violating our free will. The, this tracks with what we read throughout the New Testament. The descriptors for the Holy Spirit are not brainwash and control, it's prompt, teach, direct, guide. 
Nothing about power and control. The Holy Spirit is constantly nudging us towards the way of love, but we decide if we will follow that voice or reject it. Now, that's disappointing to me. It really messes with the way that I want to pray. You know, like, God, make my wife do it this way or make my wife realize how awesome I am or how right I am or, Lord, change her mind on this because we've been arguing for two days. Imagine, right? But God doesn't violate free will. Now, if God doesn't violate free will, I can still actually pray about all those things, but my prayers will look different. It's less of a vending machine, right? Less about controlling and changing them. As long as I put in the right amount of faith, I will get change in that person's life. I'm gonna seek the Holy Spirit to guide me in my behavior, in my approach. Lord, help me in my conversation with Trefina. Help me to be gracious, to see her perspective. If I disagree, may I do it lovingly and kind and gracious. Can't control them even through prayer, but we can control ourselves. So bottom line, God doesn't violate for free will. Last one, God doesn't usually deliver us from suffering, but walks with us through it. Ultimately, as, as Rachel was even saying, God redeems everything. And we even talked about the difference between God causing something versus redeeming it. But for today, God doesn't usually deliver us from suffering, but walks with us through it. Okay, this could be an entire series on its own, but let me just say this. As Jesus followers, we are following in Jesus' footsteps. This idea that we follow Jesus to avoid suffering, it makes no sense. Jesus suffered. Jesus was beaten. Jesus died. Virtually every one of Jesus' disciples was killed for following Jesus. And that somehow this idea you know, can persists that if you follow Jesus, everything's gonna go great. It's your Jesus followers. Jesus suffered, we will suffer. The Jesus followers in the first century did not become Jesus followers because it guaranteed them a pass in a really rough world. In fact, most of them suffered because of their faith. The first century Jesus followers became Jesus followers, not for a get out of jail free card, but because they saw someone crucified on a Roman cross and three days later, they ate breakfast with him on the beach. They saw him rise from the grave. That's why they became Jesus followers. Not because there was some sort of promise of not suffering in this life. So here's how I say it. Jesus followers are not promised a suffering free life, but a presence filled life. In this life and the one to come, Jesus promises us to never leave us nor forsake us. Now that's the topic of a whole other message, but bottom line, ending our suffering in this life is not something we're promised. Eternity, absolutely. When the kingdom is fully and finally here, yep, but not now. Jesus promises to be present to us through the Holy Spirit at all times. Promises to redeem everything. We've done entire messages on that, but but he promises to be with us. That was quick. That was a lot of information I threw at you. You probably are feeling like, you know, thanks for all the reasons why, you know, prayers are not answered. Um, but now you're probably really depressed and thinking, so why pray at all, Mark? You know, thanks for popping that balloon. If it's not this vending machine, if God isn't suspending the laws of nature normally, and if there's no way to coerce God into giving me what I want, like some divine genie, or to use God to change people's minds, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? My answer, relationship. You see, far too often we see prayer as one person instructing God on how to run the world. Instead of seeing it as we see all throughout scripture as this relational conversation of speaking and listening and sharing life with our creator, our creator who is exactly like Jesus who we can bring all our desires and requests and dreams and fears and anxiety to and experience the power of a loving God willing to be with us and journey with us through everything. I'll share a quick story before I close. Um, last summer, I shared a bit of some of our personal struggles in our family that we've been facing. Some of the challenges, especially with one of our little ones and um, some of the challenges since the diagnosis. And you can always go back and listen. It was a message uh, on pain last summer. But for the last few years, almost daily, I've prayed about this situation. And I, I write my prayers out so I can literally go back and read every single prayer for the last few years as we've been navigating this. And uh, if you were to read them, they're dark, they're desperate, they're tear-filled, there's begging and there's pleading for change, but there's also just sitting and wrestling and asking questions and listening and writing what I sense. And 
asking Jesus how I might need to change. Years later, here's what I can say. Nothing of my child's diagnosis has changed. Nothing of the way they take in the world has changed. But our home is changing. Because in all of the taking my requests to God, I've seen the way that my heart and our hearts have been changing. The way my posture and our posture and our approaches are changing. The way idols and patterns and postures that I hold and have held for a long time need to change. I've experienced this gentle, loving, leading, and guiding of the Holy Spirit. As I reread my prayer journals, I see change. I see mountain moving change. Where's the mountains that are moving? In my heart. Things that I never imagined changing are changing. Just, just this week, in response to some more challenges that we were seeing, we made another decision. We've been pivoting our life for years now, just constantly like, all right, this is the next adventure, this is the next thing. And so we made a big one this week that you know, drastically impacts our life. But this one was different because it was big, but it was also backwards. And what do I mean by backwards? It's something that Trifina and I both had strong feelings about for so much of our life, but to the opposite. In fact, 10 years ago, if you told Trifina she would one day make this change to her life in the way that we did family and raised our kids, she would have said, like literally, when hell freezes over, you know, or the Leafs win the cup, you know, either or. <laughs> and I distinctly remember times in my life, and I'm not proud of this, but I remember specifically in high school actually making fun of people who made this decision. Specifically, I remember that so specifically. So both of us, you know, this is one thing we, we held as a similar value. And yet this week, we made that decision. I can look back on the last few years of prayers and wrestling with God, and I can say a mountain moved. A mountain we never would have expected to move, but it moved in our hearts. Here's what I've discovered, that in prayer, we are relating and connecting with our creator, and that relationship moves mountains inside of us. That relationship invites us to become more like Jesus. And some of you are like, Mark, if you met me 20 years ago, you wouldn't recognize the person I am today. You have no idea the change that Jesus has done in my life because Jesus is with us every step of the way. Now, if we had another two hours, we could talk about, you know, how to pray and different parts of prayer and all that. It's beyond the scope of this message. This message, I simply just wanted to give you different things to think about on how prayer does and maybe doesn't work and why prayers seem to go unanswered, you know, kind of kill this idea of prayer being like a vending machine. And as long as you get the, the bill, you know, flat enough and get it in just the right way, it wouldn't come back out to you, but you'd actually get what you were asking for. We need to just get rid of that and see what prayer actually is. So with that said, um, next steps, can I just say, if, if prayer's a new concept for you, I'd highly encourage you, when Robin announces our next prayer night, we do that in here every few months, come. It's this amazing retreat. It's always designed in a way that's safe. If you're just trying it out, feel free. You can just sit there. We're not gonna be like, grab four other people. Now pray out loud with a bunch of strangers you just met. We don't do that, okay? It's like this amazing retreat where she just leads and guides you, and it's an incredible oasis of connecting with God and hearing from God, learning to hear God's voice. And we just are so passionate here at Lakeside that everybody can encounter God. Everybody can experience the presence of God. And that is what prayer ultimately is. And that changes and moves mountains, specifically, in my opinion, the mountains in our hearts. So as we close, I'm just gonna invite Noah up. And I wonder if we could just take a minute and be still and just pray and see how the Holy Spirit might be wanting to speak to us this morning. So let's be still, settle into our chair, and just, Holy Spirit, how would you like to speak to us?
Thanks for joining us this morning, friends. Um, our prayer teams are going to be coming up to the crosses, and they'd be so delighted to pray with you, for anything to join you in prayer and link arms with you in that way. Um, and if you're new, feel free to pop through the atrium. We'll be out there. I'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, Kathleen's at the guest services booth. She'd be happy to answer any of your questions. And uh, just hope that you have a fantastic week, and may you experience the presence of Jesus leading, guiding, comforting, nudging, and teaching you. Have a great week, friends. Thank <laughs> you.